Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Simchi Levy, whom we just heard from recently about one of his other papers. He's going to be talking with us about supply chain resiliency and the need for stress tests. So looking forward to this talk and uh, Professor Simchi Levy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen first. Uh, slide show. Uh, laser pointer. Can you see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. Thank you, um, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session. Um, as Mike said, I'm going to talk about supply chain resiliency and the need for uh, stress tests. It's appropriate to start this talk by um, describing the environment at MIT that led to the research and the impact that I will describe. At MIT, I lead uh, what we call the data science lab, whose objective is to collaborate with uh, uh, leading companies uh, and address some of the most challenging problems that these companies have by bringing together data models and algorithms. The lab is cross industry. We have companies in oil and gas, retail, financial services, airline, insurance, and it has a global uh, footprint. Companies in Europe, North America, Asia, and Latin America. Examples of some of the research direction that the lab has focused on in the last uh, few years include supply chain resiliency. Our work was implemented by multiple companies from Ford to Sigma, which is a food manufacturing company, um, to other industry, I'll talk about that uh, later on. Uh, a lot of work on price optimization. In fact, the work on price optimization and the work on customized offering is the one that motivated the research uh, what we uh, on the paper bypassing the monster that received the second place in the previous uh, session. I work with companies like Rulala, Groupon, Oracle, Coppel, which is a very large uh, uh, brick and mortar retailer in uh, Mexico, Zelando, which is the largest online fashion retailer in Europe, uh, BTEC. Um, um, Think about BTEC like a best buy of the Middle East. Uh, in all these uh, cases, we have worked on, a collaborated, and implemented um, our dynamic pricing strategy. Uh, personalized offering, if you fly uh, from you, uh, in Europe, from uh, London to Paris, for example, uh, our algorithm plays an important role. When you buy the ticket, we play no role, but once you buy the ticket, um, our algorithm uh, uh, start kicking in ancillary product. It asks you whether you are interested in uh, priority boarding, car rentals, hotels, and, and, and the like. And the offer that you will get is different than the offer that I will get. The same algorithm um, has been implemented <laughs> at uh, a number of insurance companies for customized offering. We have done a lot of work on inventory, transportation, and procurement. Our algorithm were implemented by technology companies like Blue Yonder. We have done work with Home Depot. If you know Mango, which is a, a retailer, a fashion retailer in uh, headquarter in Spain, uh, we have done a lot of work on procurement optimization with them. Online resource allocation in general with platform associated with IBM and Alibaba. Um, supply chain digitization uh, through work and collaboration with Accenture that was implemented in a number of uh, consumer packaged goods manufacturing companies. And finally, very recently during the pandemic, work uh, with AB um, InBev on demand forecasting uh, using uh, basically online regression together with pandemic modeling. Uh, similarly, um, work with uh, Zelando uh, on forecasting. 
Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the first line of work that I describe, uh, supply chain resiliency. I will start with a brief introduction, then talk about the technologies and the models that we develop, what I call the risk exposure model, uh, emphasize the need for balancing efficiency and resiliency, and summarize with key takeaways. Um, the approach that I will discuss is described in my uh, Harvard Business Review paper that was published in 2014. So this is an approach that I developed, I'll talk about that, about uh, eight, nine years ago. And some of the ideas came up in my book, uh, Operation Rule, which was published in 2011. All these ideas are going to appear together with more insight in my MBA textbook, Designing and Managing the Supply Chain, uh, the fourth edition, which is appearing uh, this month uh, after um, many years of revisions. So let me start with a, a brief uh, introduction. Um, if you look at uh, the 10 years before COVID-19, you can see companies working very hard to cut costs and increase efficiency by emphasizing uh, lean strategies, outsourcing, offshoring, consolidation. All these strategies help companies cut costs dramatically in the supply chain. But these same strategies that help companies increase efficiency uh, also increase exposure to risk. For example, if you think about uh, lean manufacturing, lean typically implies low level of inventory. Low level of inventory suggests that if there is a disruption, the supply chain will not be able to match supply with demand. Similarly, outsourcing, offshoring, consolidation imply that a lot of times the supply chain is, con is concentrated in one territory. As a result, if there is a disruption in that territory, big impact on uh, bottom on bottom line. And this is not new. People who work in the supply chain area have observed the impact of these strategies during and after events like the tsunami in Japan and the flood in Thailand in 2011, or the volcano eruption in Iceland in 2010, affecting companies in a variety of industry from the automotive to the pharmaceutical, all the way to the high-tech industry. My team at MIT started uh, focusing on supply chain resiliency after this uh, event. And uh, the papers that I mentioned, the Harvard Business Review articles that I mentioned, describe the concepts that we develop and the implementation at the Ford Motor Company um, we publicized our approach everywhere, but very few companies were interested in our approach. Everybody was focusing on, on increasing efficiency and cutting costs. We had a few uh, uh, companies that uh, used uh, our technology, uh, for example, Ford, who was happy to talk about it, um, companies in the high-tech industry, uh, companies in uh, uh, retail, but you can count them on one hand, very few companies. Everything has changed since the beginning of the pandemic. In fact, at the beginning of last year, um, in uh, February, uh, mid-February, I wrote a paper together with the high-tech executive, uh, Pierre Haren, a short paper um, that I submitted in mid-February to uh, Harvard Business Review. The paper appeared online on February 28th. So, so this, the timeline is very important. We wrote it in mid-February. It appeared online on February 28th. This is way before the pandemic was hitting either North America or Europe. In four days, our paper received huge interest. In four days, 170,000 clicks on the paper. What did we say in mid-February that generated an interest? This is the first paragraph. We said that the peak of the impact of COVID-19 on global supply chain will happen in mid-March, mid-March of 2020, forcing thousands of companies to shut down or temporarily reduce 
assembly and manufacturing activities, both in the US and in Europe. The amazing thing is that this is exactly what happened. On March 17, newspapers in Europe and in North America reported that the automotive industry in Europe is shutting down, but it's not only the automotive industry in Europe. MIT followed up uh, on March 25th and said the previous week, the week of March 17, industry in the US started shutting down and they pointed out the article that we wrote uh, a month uh, uh, before in mid-February, predicting that this should happen. So how did we come up with this prediction? I basically used the uh, risk exposure model that I'm going to describe that allow us to predict the impact of the pandemic on manufacturing and supply chain. Since that time, since that publication and of the, the realization that this technology accurately uh, estimate the impact of the pandemic. We had a flood of companies implementing our technology. So let me describe um, what this is all about and then talk a little bit about the insight, what we learned uh, in the last couple of years through implementation in companies like Ford and other companies about supply chain resiliency. And then I'll connect it with the need uh, for uh, stress test. Our starting point in the supply chain uh, resiliency model is uh, building a supply chain mapping. Here is a simplified version, of course, of Ford supply chain, starting with assembly facilities. I initially, our technology was implemented to support the supply chain for the North America assembly facilities. Later on, the technology was extended across all assembly facilities anywhere where Ford is operating. But um, the supply chain um, uh, has a complex structure, assembly facilities, tier one um, suppliers, tier two, tier three, and so forth, and, and so on. Some of the tier one facilities are facilities that belong to um, Ford, but there are many, many tier one facilities that uh, do not belong to the Ford Motor uh, companies. And a question that uh, Ford executive asked us, this is uh, 2012, after the tsunami in Japan and the flood in Thailand, question that they asked, uh, where should we focus in terms of mitigation strategies? Should we focus, for example, on the engine plant or the chemical suppliers? They said that their procurement executives their procurement executive use their experience and intuition to emphasize the importance of focusing on strategic suppliers. Who are the strategic suppliers? The strategic supplier or supplier will fall spend a lot of money with them every year. And the question was, is this intuition correct? Or maybe risk is hidden in the supply chain. To answer this question, our model is built on a few concepts. The first is what we call time to recover. What is time to recover? We look at a specific node and we ask, what is the time that it takes for this node to return to full functionality after a disruption? For example, the time to recover for the chemical supplier uh, was reported to be two weeks. Why? Because right now this chemical supplier provide product uh, chemical supply to Ford from its manufacturing facility in China. If there is a disruption, they can switch to a manufacturing facility in India, and it takes two weeks to ramp up production and provide the chemicals to uh, the supply chain. And so uh, we uh, record, we log time to recover of two weeks for this facility. And in a similar fashion, we collect data on time to recover associated with different facilities in the supply chain. Those of you with supply chain experience realize a big problem. The problem is if I call a supplier and I ask the supplier about their time to recover, the supplier is going to be optimistic. They are not going to come back and say, hey, our time to recover is very long because they know this is a problem. And so later on, I'll, I'll, I'll report, how do we validate 
the information about time to recover provided by suppliers to uh, for supply chain uh, executive. But for now, let's assume that this was validated and here uh, is a time to recover that our procurement people reported and each one of the suppliers in for supply chain. Once we have time to recover, we can determine, we can estimate performance impact. Performance impact can be financial or operational. What do we do? We remove, for example, the chemical supplier for the duration of time to recover. And we ask without this supplier for, the, for two weeks, what is the impact on Ford ability to serve customers? What is the impact on profit? How much lost profit we will have? Maybe nothing. What is the impact on revenue? What is the impact on the market share? Or what is the impact, for example, on lost production? All of this we can determine by removing this facility or sometimes group of facilities from the supply chain, allocating resources effectively by basically running a mixed integer program and reporting back loss of profit, loss of revenue, or loss of uh, production. And you can see that I'm estimating performance impact associated with each one of the nodes, the facilities and the supply chain. So by just observing this data, we can conclude that if our focus is on the engine plants and the chemical suppliers, and we need to choose where to emphasize, clearly the engine plant is a problem. But the bottleneck in this, between these two, when we consider these two facilities, is a chemical supplier. And this is what we uh, uh, call the risk exposure. It's basically the impact of uh, disruption anywhere in the business on um, Ford or the company uh, performance measures. These technologies that I just uh, described at a high level was implemented at the Ford Motor Company. The Ford, the company does not need much introduction, just a little bit about the supply chain. Remember, initially, this was implemented for the North America assembly facilities. You can see here many tier one suppliers, blue represent uh, manufacturing facilities in tier one that belongs to Ford. But uh, in addition, there are many suppliers that do not belong to Ford. Some of them are in North America, some in Europe, some in Asia. And you can see tier two and tier three and, and so forth and so on. Just a little bit about the complexity um, of the supply chain. It includes complex bill of material, uh, over 50 manufacturing facilities that belongs to Ford. Um, in tier one, we find about 4,400 uh, tier one suppliers. Um, they are located in over 60 countries. There are about 50,000 plus parts that flow between the different stages in the supply chain. And the, the North America assembly facilities, at the time we did the work, this 2013, 2014, was responsible for annual production of about 6 million vehicles, 6 million vehicles per, uh, per year. And the question was, where is risk hidden in this supply chain? The analytics suggested that if you look at tier one suppliers, among the 4,500 uh, tier one suppliers, about 2,700, almost 2,800 uh, tier one suppliers expose the company, expose for to no risk. Why? Because there is a lot of inventory. Why? Because there are backup suppliers. So these are not exposing the company to any risk. There are another 800 tier one suppliers that expose the company to some risk, but it's very low. Uh, on the other hand, about 6% of the tier one suppliers expose a company to huge risk. You can see there are about 400 tier one suppliers that expose a company to enormous risk. Who are these suppliers? And in particular, are these basically strategic suppliers? Let's look uh, at this um, screenshot. This is screenshot straight from the Ford uh, system. It appears in uh, the Harvard Business Review paper, it appears in other papers that we publish in informed uh, journals. What you see here 
are many tier one suppliers. The bubble represents different tier one suppliers. On the Y coordinate, I am showing for each tier one supplier annual spend, total yearly spend at a supplier facility, for example, here. To protect for confidential information, we don't show the value, but uh, clearly this is a strategic supplier. Here is another strategic supplier and so forth and so on. On the X coordinate, I'm showing performance impact. And here we measure performance impact by looking at loss uh, profit, right? And this is when this says uh, 50,000, means 50 million loss profit during a, a disruption. If you look at uh, this supplier at, at the top, this is clearly a strategic supplier. It exposes the company to risk, but I would say it's moderate risk. If you look at this supplier, it exposes the company to moderate risk. The risky supplier, the high risk supplier are really at the bottom right hand side. I love this guy at the bottom right hand side. This is the riskiest supplier that Ford has. Right? It's a tiny supplier that provides Ford with um, components that cost between 10 to 15 cents. So very, very low cost uh, component. But if this supplier is disrupted, huge impact on uh, bottom line. How many executives you think go to sleep and think, oh, my risky supplier is this tiny supplier that provides me with a 10, 15 cents component. Not at Ford. At Ford, they were looking at these guys. And the analytics, basically the technology based on the modeling that I described and based on mixed integer program, identify, yeah, the, the, the strategic supplier exposed the company to it, but the risky suppliers, are somewhere else. That's why I say in supply chain, risk is hidden in unexpected places. And you need data and analytics to identify in a complex network where risk is uh, hidden. So that's uh, uh, insight number one. The second insight is related to what you hear in the public media about the relationship between territory and uh, risk, typically in the public media, you will hear that risky suppliers are in Asia. So let's look at uh, the results of the implementation at Ford. Again, I took a screenshot from the Ford uh, system. Uh, bubbles represent tier one suppliers. These are tier one suppliers for the North America assembly facilities. The size of the bubble is proportional to risk exposure. The, the, the bigger the size, the more the higher uh, the risk associated with this uh, supplier, the higher the exposure that these suppliers give to a fault. To identify high risk suppliers, we, we color them in blue. You can see risky suppliers are everywhere. They are in North America, they are in Europe, and they are in Asia. That's why I say risky supplier are not necessarily in one region. And you have to be careful. You need to use analytics and data to quantify and to identify the level of risk associated with different nodes in, in the supply chain. In order to talk about my third uh, insight, uh, let me remind you the question that I asked uh, at the beginning of uh, this session. I introduced the concept of time to recover. And I said that one of the problems with time to recover um, is you need to collect it from a, a, a supplier, but the supplier may be too optimistic. So how do we validate information about time to recover? We introduce a dual concept which I will refer to as time to survive. So let me remind you what time to recover is. Time to recover is defined as the time it takes for a node to return to full functionality after a disruption. And that is the data that I have used so far. Time to survive is different. Time to survive, I can determine independent of any discussion with a supplier. What is time to survive? Time to survive is defined as the maximum time that the supply chain can match supply with demand without a specific facility. We remove a node from the supply chain and we ask how long can I match supply with demand without this facility? It's not zero, 
because the pipeline is full with inventory, but I can, I can calculate this because I build a supply chain mapping. So let's again, take data from Ford uh, supply chain. This is data about time to survive collected from the system by basically using the supply chain mapping uh, to estimate time to survive. On the X coordinate, I have uh, time to survive. And on the Y coordinate, I'm showing you how many tier one supplier have that level of time to survive. By looking at this, at this figure, you can immediately see a challenge in the opportunity. The challenge is on the left-hand side. These are all the suppliers whose time to survive is very short. So you can see that there are suppliers here with time to survive that is one day, two days, three days. I know if they are disrupted, huge impact on bottom line. So independent of what the suppliers are telling us about their time to recover, Ford is focusing on these suppliers to make sure that they can build strategies that help them dramatically increase time to survive. On the right hand side, you see the opportunity. You can see that there are many suppliers whose time to survive is greater than 50 weeks, greater than 40 weeks. Why we have many suppliers whose time to survive is greater than 50 or 40 weeks? Because for the sitting on a lot of inventory, for build a lot of redundancy. Inventory and redundancy are costly. Ford can reduce inventory maybe by 20 or 30%, still have a very long time to survive. And by doing that, find a good balance between resiliency and efficiency, which is cost savings. That's why in Insight 3, I highlight that facilities whose time to survive is short are risky facilities, no matter what the supplier is telling us. On the other hand, facilities whose time to survive is long provide saving opportunities. What did Ford do to uh, mitigate for the risk that we identified? We basically use a supplier segmentation. And, and at a high level, I'm splitting all the tier one suppliers into three categories. On the left-hand side, you have the suppliers that expose for to low level of risk. Here, it's all about contracts. Here, it's all about inventory. Here, it's all about visibility to um, supplier lead time and inventory. Lead. At the top right-hand side, I have the strategic suppliers that expose the company to a higher uh, risk. Ford is in very good position to require these suppliers to have multiple facilities in different regions. So addressing the challenge here does not seem difficult. But the bottom right hand side is where the challenge here. Take, for example, this supplier or related suppliers in this, uh, in this position on the figure. These are typically a tiny supplier. So you may say, hey, build inventory. Building inventory here is again the just-in-time and lean philosophy that people in the automotive industry have. So that's not necessarily a good strategy. You may say, okay, uh, what about dual sourcing? Well, these component provided by these suppliers, think about them like commodity. Competition in this space is very difficult because suppliers need to compete on price, that's obvious. They need to compete on quality, that's obvious. As a result, because these are low cost, there are very, very few suppliers competing in this space. If one of them is disrupted, the entire market will be disrupted. As a result, you need to think here out of the box. And one of the strategies that we have identified is new product design. Why new product design? We can standardize a component that before was designed for different vehicles. We can standardize a component across many uh, vehicles. As a result, this supplier will get much higher volume. Because the supplier is now going to get much higher volume, Ford is in very good position to require this supplier to have multiple facilities in, dif in different uh, regions. So what basically we did was to take some of these suppliers here and by changing product design, move these suppliers to 
the top right hand side box, which is where we can focus on multiple facilities at different sites. Not every company can do that. So I have seen other ways that companies address the challenge. For example, uh, I collaborated with a high tech company, again, identifying um, uh, suppliers, tiny suppliers that provide the company with low cost. What uh, one of the high tech companies did to address the challenge that I just described was to acquire this company. Now, acquiring the, 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 the company is not because they provide core technology, but rather in order to improve supply chain resiliency. Now, just acquiring does not solve the problem. They acquire the company and then they build immediately another facility in a different region so that they can respond effectively to a disruption by switching from one region to another region. So this gives you some of the insights that came up uh, in the, initially in the Ford implementation, and then during multiple uh, projects in, uh, in the last 12 months, which brings us to um, the, the emphasis um, on balancing efficiency and, uh, and, and resiliency. When you focus on uh, efficiency, Companies, of course, need to focus not on unit cost, but rather total uh, landed cost. The, this is uh, quite obvious. The question for companies is how to measure resiliency. And so remember that I published in February one paper that predicted um, the impact of COVID-19 in mid-March. And then in April, I published a follow-up uh, papers. And, and I said, we need stress tests uh, for critical supply chain. And I said the stress test can use concepts like time to recover, time to survive, and performance impact that I described. And I borrowed the, te the terminology. This is April of last year. I borrowed the terminology of stress test from the financial industry. If you remember, after the financial crisis of 2008, the federal government in the US and government in Europe established stress tests that banks need to take their business through to make sure that they are ready for the next financial crisis. And I basically said in this uh, uh, piece on how in Harvard Business Review that we need the same thing for critical supply chain. I identified a couple of them. Uh, for example, uh, the food industry, I'll talk a little bit about that. I identified the uh, healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry and life science. Uh, I, I am pleased to see that the Biden administration immediately after um, January 20th announced the establishment of stress tests for critical supply chain, much like what we uh, suggested uh, more than a year ago. Uh, in the Harvard Business Review article. And in fact, they identify a two-step process, one for a three-month process that already started, and one for a 12-month process. And I believe they ex expanded our uh, set of industry from three to six. Uh, for example, they included semiconduct, the semiconductor manufacturing industry as part of the six industries, as well as the three that I, that I just uh, uh, mentioned. Now, stress test and the need to balance resiliency and efficiency may uh, imply um, supply chain restructuring. This uh, does not mean that manufacturing will not be as well in China like today, but what it means is that we will have a hybrid strategy, what I call global local manufacturing strategy. For example, you can envision a strategy, and I'll talk about what has happened in the last year and a half. You can envision a strategy where some manufacturing are leaving uh, uh, China to sell other market, Europe, North America, and China remains a, 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 an important manufacturing center for Asia and for China uh, itself. The other thing that we emphasize in our writing is that a lot of times you don't have visibility to tier two supply, uh, uh, supplier or tier three suppliers. As a result, we establish in the supply contract 
with tier one, a time to recover requirement. So that the supplier needs to commit to a specific time to recover. If the supplier commit to a specific time to recover, we are creating a domino effect because this supplier need to do the same analysis that the OEM did in its, uh, in its uh, supply chain. Now, a supply chain restructuring is already happening. Um, despite all the things that you hear from all sorts of sources, there is a dramatic shift in the manufacturing uh, network. Um, here is a, a survey from before the pandemic, uh, January 2020, as a result of the China-US trade war. Manufacturing, uh, global manufacturing companies have started ship, um, shifting manufacturing activities and creating a plan B. It's not that they don't keep manufacturing in, uh, in China, but they now do a lot of manufacturing outside China to avoid paying tar tariff. So this idea that uh, the previous administration had that by establishing tariff, we are going to see manufacturing coming back to the US, this is not happening in my opinion. What, what does happen is that manufacturing are starting to move out of, uh, China. This is um, a, a survey from uh, 2020, from January 2020. I did my data science lab did a similar survey in June of 2020. We basically saw the same insight, and I saw in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal exactly the same the same thing. So what we see in all these uh, surveys is the following that there is a move outside China, but a lot it's to India and Southeast Asia, in particular countries like uh, Vietnam, and some move closer to market demand uh, to uh, Latin America and to Eastern Europe. I'll talk about that uh, um, in the next few slides. It is especially true in three industries, apparel, high-tech, and life science. For example, apparel is moving. There is no question about that, despite what you read from all sorts of sources. Apparel is moving outside China, specifically to the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and countries like that. High tech is different. High tech is moving much closer to market demand. We see manufacturing activities in Mexico, manufacturing activities in Brazil, to sell market demand in North America. We see manufacturing activities in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, for example, to sell European countries. Life science is different. I'll talk about why and how it is changing uh, in a minute. The second observation that I want to emphasize, which is built on uh, the insight that I showed you early on through the fourth case study, is that these statements that you hear over and over again, we need to reshore to increase resiliency, does not hold water. And I showed you uh, these statements through the fourth case study, but I want to show you a, another example that illustrates the point uh, that I'm making. And that was clear, crystal clear um, last year, if you look at the food supply chain. In North America, the food supply chain for beef and pork is completely domestic. This industry has gone through dramatic consolidation where companies try to cut costs uh, significantly in their business. So they close manufacturing facilities and only kept a few of them. Remember my observation in the second slide. Consolidation allow companies to, to reduce costs, increase efficiency, but increase exposure to, to risk. And that's what happened during the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, one of the facilities that uh, a large uh, beef and pork manufacturing company uh, had one of the manufacturing facilities had to close. Huge shortage in the US dramatic uh, uh, re, uh, uh, price uh, increase um, in the market. Uh, farmers were not uh, uh, receiving orders. 
enormous impact on uh, the supply chain. That's why I say just moving manufacturing activities from one country to another is not going to guarantee resiliency in the supply chain. The, the last uh, element that I want to emphasize, and again, I'm happy to see that uh, the uh, Biden administration is emphasizing uh, this. Uh, this type of changes require government uh, involvement. And, and let me highlight this by emphasizing uh, life science. In life science, in my opinion, we need government uh, uh, involvement, not only in terms of uh, establishing stress tests, but even more importantly, in terms of uh, uh, developing new technology. Why am I emphasizing new technology? Um, if you think about what happened in the uh, life science uh, industry, a lot of manufacturing activities moved out of North America and Europe to China and India, not only because of cost, but a lot because these manufacturing processes are highly polluting uh, processes. So European country, North America started moving all these manufacturing activities um, elsewhere uh, to Asia, in particular to two countries, India and China. If we want manufacturing to, to increase resiliency and to increase our ability to respond to the next pandemic, we want to, to achieve all of this we need to move manufacturing activities um, out of this country, at least build alternative plants. But if you build an alternative plan, it's not going to happen with the same polluting manufacturing activities. You need to develop clean chemical manufacturing technologies. Developing clean chemical manufacturing technology takes enormous time and requires significant investment. Where is the investment is going to come from? It's going to, it needs to come from, from uh, a consortia of industry and, and government. That's why I'm emphasizing that uh, government needs to be involved in terms of establishing stress tests, in terms of uh, providing the infrastructure and the funding for new technology that motivate some of the movement that are needed in order to avoid some of the problems that we saw last year, for example, one of the problems that we saw is, especially in life science and healthcare, uh, there was, uh, by certain countries, uh, national security policy, meaning these countries did not let product to cross borders in order to um, make sure that they maintain the same um, uh, supply that they believe they need for their own countries. In order to protect and then against these types of challenges, one need uh, uh, um, to move uh, some activities outside uh, Asia. And so uh, I'm emphasizing uh, key supply chain trains um, that motivate uh, new infrastructure, including increasing labor costs in developing countries, the China-US trade war, uh, what we have seen uh, in the last 12 months is uh, economic nationalism, what I described just a minute ago, um, especially for critical product. Uh, think about this product as national security uh, product. We cannot afford being dependent on other countries not allowing these products to cross borders. Another reason we see companies restructuring the supply chain is automation is taking off. Because automation is taking off, this is no longer about low cost manufacturing. It's now more so about having the right skills of people to interact with uh, the automation. Uh, reshoring is not necessarily the solution. As I, men as I mentioned, you really need to apply stress tests. And uh, I believe the, the federal government need to be involved in order to uh, provide standard and stress test to make sure that supply chain are ready for the next disruption. I will just point out that there are a couple of HBR articles and Sloan Management Review articles that I published in the last 12 months that talk about the insight I just described. 
let me pause here and see if there are comments or questions. Okay, thank you very much for that. Very insightful and, and really interesting talk. Appreciate, especially, I uh, appreciate the idea of the, the time to survive insight and those hidden risk suppliers. Really fascinating stuff. So thank you, David. And um, let me open it up and check the chat and Q&A and see if anyone from, from the audience would like to ask uh, Professor Simpson Levy a question. Okay. Is there anybody uh, from industry on uh, this uh, um, a conference? If there is, I would love to hear, not a question, but a comment from people in industry um, on either the approach that we describe here, or what do they do to um, make sure that they find the right balance between efficiency and resiliency? So I, I don't want to push, of course, are the comment on the chat or the Q&A, Mike? No, no, yeah, there are one. And I agree, this, the balance between resilience and, and efficiency, I'd love to hear their thoughts on. I've, so John in the Q&A asks, have you incorporated inventory modeling into risk modeling? Yeah, so inventory, just let me focus immediately on this. Inventory is building the supply chain mapping. Remember the supply chain mapping? that I described, it, it model specific uh, nodes, specific processes. For example, in one of the companies where we did it just in the last couple of uh, weeks, um, the detail of manufacturing process in each uh, facility, in each facility there are maybe 12 steps that um, uh, are applied in order to produce the finished goods. And then the company is keeping finished goods inventory and raw material in inventory. All these inventories, a part of the model, uh, John. Okay. And then Ming, Ming Hu asks, how about suppliers beyond tier one? How do you assess the risks specifically of suppliers outside of the first tier? Uh, an excellent question, Ming. Uh, thank you so much. And we are going to talk on Sunday. Um, but uh, related to your question, Ming, um, uh, in the case of Ford, to illustrate this uh, specifically, they had um, visibility, of course, let me switch back to the supply chain mapping. They had visibility, uh, of course, to tier one supplier and some visibility, especially in the electronic stuff to tier two, but not much. That's why supply contract was very important. I mean, so for example, take a supplier where my laser pointer is, we don't know the supply chain of these suppliers. And so Ford in the contract said, you need to commit to a time to recover, say I'm inventing this of two weeks. Why this is a solution? Because in order for this supplier to commit for a two weeks time to recover, they need to do the same analysis that I just did at Ford to guarantee that if there is a disruption, they can respond in two weeks. How do you do that? By applying the risk exposure model. So we basically created a domino effect around the supply chain. But I should uh, highlight, we, uh, you can see the blue facility. So we had some tier two, some tier three, but not very um, uh, detailed uh, information like what we had on tier one. So this is an excellent question that require us to innovate in terms of the supply contract itself. Great, thank you. We're, we're running out of time. There are a couple more. Let's try to get to one more quickly. Um, Nomita asks, for how long are the results of the stress testing valid, uh, given that the pandemic is still going on, or more generally, how often uh, do Very we nice. need to do this stress testing? Again, a really excellent question. So, so initially we did the implementation at four. I'll, I'll describe everything at four, and then I'll talk about what has happened in the last 12 months. Um, we did as a standalone. So you do it once, but immediately uh, people realize the question that uh, I, I was asked just uh, a, a second ago. And what Ford did, they basically integrated this technology with their IT infrastructure. And now the model is running every week. Every week, the model generates 
a risk exposure report. And every procurement director receive a report. So if I'm a procurement director responsible to the, my Asian suppliers, I receive a report on the risk exposure associated with each one of these suppliers. Why every week? Because inventory is changing, lead times are changing, and so the report is dynamic. In the last 12 months, we have seen companies starting to do this to understand hidden risk, and then some companies are running it on a quarterly basis. But I'm giving you the extreme, which is for starting 2014, running our system on a weekly basis. Great, great. Thank you very much. Well, well thanks again for all the great information. I appreciate your time, Professor Simchi Levy, and